Hello. Welcome back to the Space School Log. Today we'll be doing What If Revan Trained Luke. Before we begin, special thanks to all of our patrons. The next part of our mini series comes out on Saturday. Our story begins in the final year of the Jedi Civil War, in the year 3956 BBY. We find our heroes on the Outer Rim world of Tatooine. As they search for the Rackin and Star Map, inside of the cave of a legendary crate dragon. Revan and Bastila Shan were walking through the barren deserts of Tatooine. They found themselves in the eastern Dune Sea. They had recently been the ones to kill a crate dragon in the desert, though the only reason Revan and Bastila killed the crate dragon was because it was hunting them. They didn't originally intend on killing the large reptile, but they had no other choice. The two of them walked towards a large structure that sat out in the desert. The structure was a formation of rocks, but on the inside was a Rakatan star map. The two Jedi had come for the map so they could stop the evil Lord Malak before he and his forces destroyed the galaxy via the usage of the Star Forge. When the two entered the cave, Revan felt a call to do something. Ever since he returned from serving the Sith, he'd been keeping a memoir with him, a Jedi holocron outlining all of his emotions and how he dealt with his transfer from Republic soldier to Jedi. It outlined all of his training with the Jedi and all of his emotions, now as a Jedi. Revan didn't believe that it was finished, but it felt like the Force was telling him to leave the holocron here, for whatever reason, inside the cave. So, Revan assumed it would be a guide for the future, maybe, maybe not. Bastila and Revan grabbed their piece of the Rakatan star map, and before they left, Revan ignited his lightsaber, cut a hole in the side of the rocks inside of the cave, and sat down his holocron. When Bastila asked him what he was doing, Revan explained that he was making sure whoever needed to find it would find it as he looked at the holocron and followed her out of the cave. The year is 12 BBY on the planet of Tatooine, and a young man raised out in the desert is out on an adventure. Both of his parents were Jedi, and he was raised with the Tusken Raiders in the Dune Sea. Asherad Het knew the Dune Seas very well, and from time to time he would journey into the wastelands or into Krayt Dragon Caves for fun. He knew he was very Force-sensitive because he'd been trained by his parents from a young age, but he also was an adventurer. He loved going out into the seas of the Dune Sea. He knew Tatooine just as well as the Tusken Raiders did, and he loved it. During this particular outing, Asharad went east into the Dune Sea. He had, for the longest part of his life, been told to avoid that part of the Dune Sea, because of how common it was to see a crate dragon alive out there, though they were rare. They typically hunted Banthas, because nothing else across Tatooine would really feed them. Asharad came up across the Dune Sea sand, traveling for days. Another great adventure for him. The entire time he'd been on Tatooine, he'd never seen a living crate dragon. Of course, he knew of the relics of the dragon that had been sitting across the seas for centuries. Apparently, it had been killed by Jedi, and it saved generations of Tusken Raiders. Regardless, Asherad was looking for his first crate dragon, and then he came across a cave. The cave was large and dark. When Asherad entered, the two suns slowly vanished and his eyes began to adjust to the darkness inside the cave. He made sure to be wary of a possible beast. He carried a lightsaber, but he rarely used it. The lightsaber was a gift by his parents. Without his knowledge, his parents had been trying to track him down, to let him know that they were leaving Tatooine to help the Jedi on the run from the Purge, but they couldn't find him. Ashrod walked through the cave, and he found a small hole in the wall. As he walked up to it, he put his hand in blindly. Asherad was trusting the Force to get here, because as much as he wanted to see a crate dragon, he didn't really want to play with one. When he reached in, he grabbed out a cubed rock, and so he brought it out. The cube had a dim blue glow to it, and Asherad pulled it into his arms. When he did, he was sent back to a time long before him, and he saw an evil man striking down civilizations, burning people away. Asherad fell back of his feet, and he ignited his lightsaber and looked around. He could hear voices. While Asherad hadn't access to Holocron, he was tapping into the light and the dark side of the Force from the one who left the Holocron here. Revan hadn't intended on leaving his essence behind with so much negativity, but it was inextricably connected to him, as he was a balance of light and dark. Asherad may have been raised by Jedi, but there sat a very powerful darkness within him. It was very common for those raised in the sands of Tatooine to have darkness. The planet had a negative aura around it, and it surrounded those who were adept with the Force, especially those who at the time of their connection to Tatooine weren't able to process the darkness that resonated inside the planet. 
There was a terrible scream heard from the edge of the tunnel, and Ashura jumped from his feet and started to run. As he sheathed his lightsaber, he may or may not have actually awoken a crate dragon with his insatiable timing. The dragon had a tendency to go in and out of hibernation, and at the moment the beast was enjoying its hibernation until the sound of an echo of a lightsaber drew it from his rest. Asherad got to the mouth of the cave, being blinded by the brightness of the twin suns, but he saw two outlined individuals, one of them telling him to get down as the other used the force and threw Asherad away from the mouth of the cave. Two lightsabers ignited as a rumbling around the ground opened up and a screech could be heard as an all-powerful crate dragon came out and slammed down, creating a seismic event, throwing both Asherad parents off their feet. The two Jedi got up and moved in to defend themselves without hurting the crate dragon. They knew it was just an innocent animal trying to protect itself, but they also need to make sure their son got away safely, while at the same time, they had a chance to get themselves away to safety as well. When the Krayt Dragon turned his attention to Asherod's parents, their lives were essentially over. They may have been Jedi, but they were by no means exceptionally talented Jedi. The two of them did everything in their power before they were crushed by the Krayt Dragon. Asherod, on the other hand, did everything he could, slashing at the tail of the Krayt Dragon with his lightsaber. But when the dragon felt the pinch on his tail, it flipped its tail backwards and sent Asherod flying and slamming down into the sands of Tatooine with a broken vertebrae. Asherod wouldn't wake up for several days. When he eventually woke up, he couldn't move. He couldn't see his parents and it was pitch black across the sands of Tatooine. There wasn't even a sign of anything remaining. As he tried to get up, he couldn't move. His back was completely paralyzed, and as he looked over towards the entrance of the cave, he saw the boots of his parents. There was a glimmer off the moonlight, some sort of liquid on the boots. As Asherad realized what it was, he screamed out in anger. His parents were dead, and it was because of him. All that powerful darkness he felt from the stone he found inside the cave rushed through his veins and anger lifted him like a possessed man. He was still badly injured, but he walked over towards the remains of what used to be his parents and buried them. Instead of honoring his parents, he ignited his lightsaber and walked into the cave of the Krayt Dragon to slay the beast. On the other side of Tatooine, a former Jedi Master rose from his sleep. Obi-Wan knew that there were other Jedi on the planet, but this was not a Jedi. There was a dark essence in the Force. Kenobi never slept well because of his nightmares, though for Obi-Wan, he knew that this essence didn't belong to Sidious. Obi-Wan may have been cut off from the Force, but it by no means didn't mean that he couldn't sense things around him or even feel them. This surge of darkness could raise the least Force-sensitive person in the galaxy from their sleep with goosebumps and chills. Kenobi decided to make sure Luke was alright as he made his way towards the lookout over the moisture farm to see if anything was wrong. It was obvious there was nothing wrong, and so he took a deep breath and tried to find peace with himself before going back to sleep. Something that didn't happen because he spent so much time trying to communicate to his old master. Qui-Gon never answered, and Obi-Wan couldn't sleep after ever being awoken. By morning, Kenobi returned to his day job, cutting meat and partaking in the jury lifestyle that was not accustomed to a Jedi. While Kenobi may have been returning to work, on the other side of the Dune Sea, walking from the cave of the Krayt Dragon, was a man. No more a man. He was no longer the good kid that his parents raised. His self-loathing drove him beyond his own capabilities, alongside the essence of one of the most powerful Sith Lords the galaxy had ever seen. The man named Ashrad was gone, and in his place was a new Sith to challenge the rule of Palpatine, that Sith Lord being named Darth Krayt, named after the beast that took everything from him, including his dignity. When Krayt left the cave in the morning, he saw trails. It was the Jawas. They had seemingly taken his rock, but truthfully, Krayt no longer wanted that wasteful piece of Dune Sea history that got his parents killed. And so, Darth Krayt started walking towards the nearest spaceport so he could go challenge the Sith. The holocron would sit dormant inside of a Jawa sand crawler for months upon months. It would travel across the Dune Sea. It would show itself in markets and it would pop up in front of moisture farms. None of them wanted it. Because the Jawas couldn't sell it, they passed it on to another tribe of Jawas. One of the Jawas, named Tika, was a female in her tribe and she thought she had the perfect hobo to sell it to. Tika had many interactions with Ben Kenobi, and so she went to talk to Ben about the possibility of him buying this really, really cool rock that was super colorful. Tika knew the chances of making the sale were really low, but when she entered Kenobi's cave, she was pleasantly surprised to see Ben openly purchasing the magic rock. Truthfully, Tika was like any other Jawa, trying to turn a profit, and Kenobi was just another customer that fell upon their upselling prices. Regardless, the Jawas finally got rid of the Jedi Holocron, and that Holocron was now sat safely inside the hands of Obi-Wan Kenobi. 
He took the holocron and sat it inside of his chest. Obi-Wan hadn't been using the Force, and the only reason he took this was in case the Inquisitors or the Empire found themselves on Tatooine. They wouldn't assume that the Jedi were on the planet. With him having bought it, there was no chance that the Inquisitors or the Empire would assume that there were Jedi on the planet. Truthfully, Ben bought the holocron not just to keep himself safe, or Luke safe, but the Jawas, and the other Jedi on the planet, and essentially the rest of the population. Kenobi may have not been up to date on galactic news, but people talked. They talked about the Siege of Minbon, the disappearance of the Kaminoans, the raids of Sereno and Raxus. All these events were just more propaganda for the Empire, and more stuff for people to talk about. But Obi-Wan heard the information enough that he took the holocron to keep the people of Tatooine safe from any of those Imperial operations. Kenobi having put the holocron in his chest would avoid thinking about it, but the truth is, he couldn't avoid it. The essence that rang off the holocron was way too much for even him. Kenobi went to work with the thought of it on his mind the entire day. There was a severe risk of unveiling his ability to use the Force. The Empire had been getting closer to the Outer Rim, and just the day before there was a Jedi who tried to communicate with him. Kenobi wasn't entirely sure if the Inquisitors were on Tatooine or not, but the truth is, they were. And they were searching for the Jedi named Nari. When Kenobi left work, he found Nari hung in the town square. It was shameful. Obi-Wan tried to give him a chance to escape the planet, but he didn't take it. Hiding would have served Nari much better than facing the Empire by himself. Kenobi sent the message to everyone, to avoid the Empire, to stay hidden. Regardless, when he returned to his cave, he had come in contact with Bale and Brea Organa. Obi-Wan was requested to go and save Leia Organa, who had been abducted. While this would eventually lead to a chain of events, before Bale came to Tatooine, Kenobi would open himself up to the Force and access the artifact, seeing what his true potential held. While Kenobi was attuned enough to the Force that he could handle the balance that sat in handling the artifact, he realized upon opening it that it was full of light. While Kenobi was accessorizing with the artifact and listening to the messages it had, he was visited by Bale Organa, and he would agree to the mission to save Leia. After several days, Kenobi would return from a fight with Darth Vader and saving the Princess of Alderaan, and would decide that he would, in a way, respect Owen's decision. Kenobi picked apart the holocron that he had, and took away the imbalance of the outer part of the holocron. Kenobi then took apart the Skyhopper that he was going to give to Luke, and then placed the holocron inside of the toy, the most important piece of the holocron, the piece of the holocron that would teach Luke everything he needed to learn about the Force as it showed all of Revan's teachings and all of his lessons that he learned on the path to recovery. Obi-Wan knew of Revan, but it was very limited knowledge of the Jedi from thousands of years before. But all the information inside the holocron would be a great tool for Luke to use, because only Luke, being Force-sensitive, would be able to access these files, whereas Owen and Beru, if they handled the toy, wouldn't access anything. So when Obi-Wan moved locations from the cave to a more suitable house, he gave Luke the Skyhopper toy, knowing that if Luke were anything like his father, he would realize his true power by accident, and come to access it through that. Owen wouldn't think anything about this toy, and Kenobi would disappear into the desert, after giving a heroic hello there to the son of Anakin. As he traveled through the desert, he ran into his master, Qui-Gon Jinn finally having the opportunity to talk to his master once again. Luke loved his Skyhopper toy, because he chased adventure. He imagined that he drove pod racers and starfighters when he wasn't working on the farm. Luke craved adventure, and soon after playing with his Skyhopper toy, he began to have dreams, very vivid dreams of the future, and having an astromech, a starfighter, and being a hero. It was like he became a mythical figure, something Luke always believed he was destined for. While Owen told Luke that his father was a navigator and a spice freighter, that was far from the truth. The more Owen and Beru tried to shield their son from the Force, and the lineage of which he came from, the more they pushed him towards it. Luke was his father's son. He wanted adventure, and he wanted to be free from Tatooine and see the entire galaxy. Though, once these dreams started, they only got more intense, with each dream revealing something new to Luke about himself and the Force he had within him. Luke was very entranced with these possibilities. When he wasn't with his father, he began holding brooms and using them like laser swords he saw in his dreams. The Force worked in mysterious ways, and Luke was experiencing how mysterious they could be. Though as the Force started to open up within Luke, he began to tap into a legacy of power that sat within him. He experimented with his eyes closed before he went to sleep, pushing and pulling objects across the room, closing his eyes and being able to see everything in his room, outside his room, and all the way out to the moisture farm. Luke's vision was heightening, and it was only a matter of time until he would expand it far greater than it already was. Luke, once asleep, would have balance between lucid dreaming and vivid dreaming. 
During Luke's vivid dreams, he would interact with Revan and Qui-Gon Jinn. Luke met both of them during separate times, and he learned their names relatively quickly. Though, when he had lucid dreams, he communicated with each of them respectfully, asking them questions about what he was feeling and garnering a new understanding of his powers. Though Luke made a specific point to hide this information from Uncle Owen, he didn't think Baru would have an issue with it, but he didn't want to test that theory. While powerful light was growing in the Outer Rim, the core was growing darker by the millisecond. Sidious was very disappointed in his student's failure to best Kenobi, and even more than that, his student's inability to see clearly. Sidious learned from the Grand Inquisitor that Lord Vader ordered the Star Destroyer to follow Kenobi's vessel instead of the rest of the path. It was Vader who was unable to defeat Kenobi a second time, and it was Vader who cost the Empire resources in chasing the path, only to leave it empty-handed by chasing Kenobi. Though it's not like the resources lost in chasing the path were all that significant to the Empire. It was more so the fact that the Empire chased down a singular Jedi for its head Jedi hunter to be made a fool of. It was a disappointment to Lord Sidious. But the new information he learned about Vader wasn't the greatest disturbance to him. It was the growing darkness on his side of the galaxy. With Vader on Mustafar, there was no feasible opponent other than an unknown foe for Palpatine to face. But there was a foe that Sidious hadn't yet heard about. The Dark Lord of the Sith told his guardsmen to prepare themselves and batten down the hatches. The guards listened, but they didn't really understand the fear, considering they were on Coruscant, which was the most defended planet in the entire galaxy. Though a small starfighter landed in the city streets of Coruscant, Darth Krait walked through the streets of the city. During the very long trip through hyperspace, he meditated on the dark side, focusing on what evilness resonated inside the holocron he touched so long ago. Ever since the death of his parents, he prepared himself to kill the only challenges to his power. Krait could feel Sidious buzzed his rival because Palpatine was the Emperor, but the issue is he didn't know about Vader. Because Vader wasn't in the public image, he was only known to those in the military. Darth Krait, by touching the holocron, gained some, but not all, the memories of Revan, and some of those memories gave him information on the secrets of the Jedi Temple here on Coruscant, its secret access points, and so forth. Krait entered through the lower access ports of the Jedi Temple, now being the Emperor's castle. Krait could feel the Emperor's power, and it empowered him. Krait fed off the dark side of the Force in the same way that Windu could use the dark side of the Force against his opponents. Krait fed off the power of his opponent, especially a dark side opponent. Being that Palpatine was so powerful, Krait drew on this power in the dark side and allowed it to course through his body as he made his way towards the throne room, located in the former High Council chambers. When Krait exited the hinted tunnels, he could see royal guards placed sporadically throughout the facility. He wasn't too concerned with them. If they came after him, then they would just be slaughtered. But his main objective was the Sith Lord. Palpatine, on that hand, rose from his throne and stood in his power, dismissing his guards towards the elevator. When they got to the elevator, the doors flew open, and the guards' bodies were thrown through the walls into Palpatine's room. The Sith Lord stood tall, watching his opponent walk towards him. Palpatine demanded to know who this was that stood before him. Krait stepped forward and didn't say a word. Palpatine knew this would be a fight between the Force, seeing as Krait's first move wasn't to grab his lightsaber, which he had two on his belt. Sidious shot lightning at Krait immediately. Krait moved out of the way as the lightning hit a panel and exploded. Krait shot lightning at Sidious and the Dark Lord used his own lightning as he shot back at him and the two Sith's lightning interlocked. This was a fight of the Force and of strength. Krait started to gain an advantage only due to have him drawing off of Palpatine's power. But Palpatine was a tactical genius. He knew what was happening as he spun forward over igniting both of his lightsabers. Krait fell backwards and ignited his own lightsaber blocking Sidious. Sidious may have been old and damaged, but he wasn't helpless. Krait stumbled backwards as he got to his feet and blocked every swing coming his way. Krait knew in a dueling scenario he wouldn't be able to defeat this Sith Lord, and so using everything in his power, he pushed Sidious back. Krait used the force to pull objects across the room towards Sidious, but every time an object got close, Sidious cut it into pieces, turning all of his attention towards Krait as he swung and cut through Krait's arm, and the Sith from the desert fell backwards. Sidious stood over Krait, calling him a fraud for believing he could challenge the rule of the Sith. Krait crawled backwards, looking for a way out as he watched Sidious raise his blade and strike down on him. Krait kicked his foot up as Sidious jabbed down through the bottom of his foot through his entire leg. Sidious ripped the lightsaber out, and before he could land the final killing blow, Krait shot lightning forward as it flew into Sidious' face. The Dark Lord fell to his knees as Krait rolled around and swung his lightsaber through Sidious' legs, and as Sidious fell backwards, Krait drove his blade forward and slashed through Sidious' face. Krait laid his head back and took a deep breath. 
There was no feasible way that he could have won that battle, but he didn't. Using the force to put Sidious' lightsaber on his belt, he hobbled to his feet and made his way for a great escape. On Mustafar, Fader felt Palpatine's death and immediately got out of his back to tank so that he could travel to Coruscant to do damage control. Vader's son, on the other hand, stood in the doorway of his homestead. It was nighttime. He could hear the whistling of the winds and he could feel the sand blowing into his clothes. Luke had a backpack on, and inside was a skyhopper. But it was nighttime. It wasn't day. Luke was awoken by a dream, and he was a child possessed. He knew what he needed to do, and where he needed to go, but he wasn't sure if he was ready for such a journey. The dream told him to head due west from the homestead and find a man by the name of Ben Kenobi. This was a message from Qui-Gon. The message from Revan was to bring the Skyhopper. Luke was very afraid as he stood at the door. He was technically running away from home. The systems were turned on, and so if he ran, he would set off all the defense systems at the homestead. But if he turned the systems off, they would leave Owen and Beru unguarded. So Luke waited until the night was almost over, and he escaped into the darkness after turning off the system. Luke was ready for this adventure, but he was also very nervous. So he ran out to the desert under the cover of night. He could feel where he was going, as if he was being led by his own intuition. The voice in his head gave him confidence that no matter where he went, he'd be protected. Kenobi was unaware of this particular circumstance, and so when he felt the presence of Skywalker approaching in the middle of the night, he knew the holocron must have worked. Kenobi wrapped himself up in his robes and exited the homestead as he walked outside and searched for Luke. Kenobi had to be extra careful, because he didn't know if the Tuscans would be out on the prowl or not. Kenobi was well known by the Tuscans, and they left him alone for the most part. Kenobi looked down into a valley and saw a little boy walking. In his backpack, Kenobi could see the Skyhopper toy that he gave him. Ben moved down the side of his abode and got down in front of Luke and called out to him. Luke saw Ben and recognized him from the first time they met, not too long beforehand. Luke asked Ben if he was the one that he was meant to find. Ben nodded his head, saying, If the Force guided you to me, then I am the one you were meant to find. Luke started forward, following Obi-Wan back up to the homestead. Kenobi made sure that Luke was alright, and situated before asking Luke why he came here. When Kenobi got the question out, Luke informed him that he was told to. He kept having dreams, and two men told him to come here. Luke said that Obi-Wan likely wouldn't know the names, to which Obi-Wan told Luke to tell him what the names were, because he might know. Luke responded, saying that Revan was one of them, and Qui-Gon Jinn was the other. Kenobi leaned back in his chair with a smile on his face. He looked up, and then looked back down at Luke, saying, Well, Luke, I do know them. Master Jin was my master. And Ravan was an ancient Jedi. Very powerful. Very wise. Just like your father. Luke responded immediately, asking about his father. See, Ben knew that Luke would come. And it was just a matter of time until the holocron drove him here. Maybe it was wrong, but Owen was holding Luke back. Obi-Wan knew better than to hold back a Skywalker. So giving this holocron to Luke was ensuring that Luke would make the right choice for himself. If Luke didn't make the choice, then so be it, but because Luke came looking for answers, he was making the choice to start his journey as a Jedi. Accessing the holocron, while unintentional, gave Luke information he could have never gotten through Owen and Beru. Luke knew that his uncle and aunt were lying about his father, and the more his dreams happened, the more the holocron fed him information, the more adept he also became. Obi-Wan at this point knew he could tell Luke about his father. Luke, what your uncle told you about your father was wrong. Anakin Skywalker was a powerful Jedi Knight. He was not just a cunning warrior, but a great friend. But a pupil of mine by the name of Darth Vader betrayed and murdered your father. Vader was consumed by the dark side of the Force. I... I truly miss your father, Luke. Luke looked at Ben. Luke, being so adept of the Force, could almost see into Ben's mind. And he saw glimpses, pictures almost, of what Ben was thinking about. What Ben was seeing. And Luke asked, Who is the man behind the mask? Obi-Wan snapped out of his nightmare and looked at Luke, and leaned forward. Obi-Wan didn't actually think Luke would catch on to the Force so quickly, but because he was so young, he picked up on the Force a lot quicker. If he had been older, it would have taken him much more time. But Luke was just a boy, and he didn't have the same baggage as a young adult would have had. His mind was a sponge to the Force, so Ben told Luke what he saw. The man behind the mask is your father, Luke. When I last saw him, I thought I could save Anakin. But there's too much Vader in him. There was a brief moment where I saw my friend, the good man that was your father, but he disappeared before my eyes, consumed by Vader. Luke looked at Ben and then asked him if his father was still alive. Ben nodded his head and then spoke up. I want to believe that Anakin is still alive. Maybe someday he'll see the light. But when I left him, there was none of that. There's... there's too much hate in him. 
Luke didn't really understand, but Kenobi moved on from the topic, asking Luke about his dreams, and what it is that he knew, or why he came out here. Luke told Obi-Wan everything, and then continued telling Ben that he didn't want anything to do with his aunt or uncle. Luke loved them, in a way, but he thought they were all taking advantage of him. Luke believed yes, that he should have chores, and he should have responsibilities, but what he felt within him now felt as if he belonged somewhere else, not on a farm. Obi-Wan made a personal note that Luke was speaking beyond his years. It was very possible that the voice of Revan, or even the ever-elusive voice of Qui-Gon Jinn, got to him and opened him up in his mind. Obi-Wan knew that Revan was powerful, but maybe Revan had a lot more to share than Kenobi initially thought. Luke told Ben that he wanted to become a Jedi like his father, but he didn't want to go back to the farm. Maybe as a man, he could return and be friendly with the Lars, but right now, he knew he needed to have time to grow as an individual. Profound thoughts for someone not much older than 10 years old. Regardless, Ben agreed to these terms. Across the galaxy on Coruscant, Lord Vader arrived. He discovered the dead bodies of the Royal Guards, and that of Palpatine too. Vader knew that the responsibility of Sith Lord fell down onto him, and as for the role of Emperor, should he become the Emperor, and kill all who oppose him? or should he allow Tarkin to become a puppet for him? As Vader thought about it, the doors behind him opened, and he turned around to see his favorite Imperial officer, the likely successor to the throne of Palpatine. Vader stood tall, and his presence was overbearing as he turned and looked down at Tarkin. The governor was a close ally of Palpatine, just as close as anyone could get. Tarkin had the full support of the entire Imperial military complex, because he was the architect of it. Vader, on the other hand, was a ghost, never seen, never heard, and only feared. There were multiple ways for the Dark Lord of the Sith to play this, being that it was obvious by Sidious's wounds and the missing ligaments on the ground that the person who did this was no Jedi. Our story continues on the planet of Coruscant. With the Emperor dead, the Empire needed to do something about the hole in leadership. If they didn't do something about it, then they would be doomed by a power gap in the galaxy. Palpatine hadn't yet fully taken power away from the Senate, and with Palpatine dead, the Senate could very easily take more control over the Senate itself, and move power away from the Galactic Empire's military-industrial complex. It's something that someone like Tarkin was especially concerned about. With Vader and Tarkin in the same room, Tarkin still embracing his favorability with the Emperor, told the room that he would be taking over control of the Empire, effective immediately. Vader whipped around his head towards Tarkin. The Grand Moff saw this as an absolute threat, which it was. Vader towered over Tarkin, but he didn't fear the henchmen of the Sith Lord. He told Vader that there was nothing he could do to convince the Empire to listen to him. Vader raised his hand, and Tarkin slowly started to lose the ability to breathe. He looked at Vader. The Dark Lord of the Sith spoke up. They don't need to listen to me. They need to listen to my puppet. And you are not my puppet. Tarkin's neck snapped, and he dropped to the ground. Without a second thought, Vader turned around towards the Royal Guard and told them to make sure that Masameda was in the former Emperor's office. Their job afterwards would be to clean up the mess behind him. Vader, within the coming hour, would arrive in the former Emperor's office. Masameda would arrive and look at Vader sitting in Palpatine's former seat. When the Grand Visor arrived in the Emperor's office, he was surprised to see Vader. He was very unaware of the fact that the Emperor had been killed, so seeing Vader sit in his master's seat was a little bit interesting. Vader didn't hold back. He immediately started talking to Masameda, informing him that an assassin killed Palpatine inside of his castle. Vader would be taking control over the Empire now. However, Vader would not represent the face of the Galactic Empire. Vader admitted he wasn't the political genius that Palpatine was. However, he was the new de facto leader of the Empire. Masameda, on the other hand, would represent the face of the Empire. Essentially, to the general public, it would look like nothing changed. The reason being is that Palpatine very rarely made a public appearance. Even in the Senate, where he ruled with an iron fist, he rarely showed himself. It's because as Emperor, he technically didn't need to, and so the majority of the time, Masameda would preside over the Senate as the Grand Visor. Vader's orders were simple. You will do as I say. You will not go outside the realm of my control. You will make sure the Empire does not fail, and I will destroy my rival. Masameda nodded his head. He knew better than to try and openly challenge Vader, though something ironic about Vader's rise to power was what he did with it. Darth Vader, being a former slave, decided that it was unnecessary for the Empire to be using slave labor. However, he was not opposed to using prison slave labor, which at this point was contributing to major projects across the Empire, such as Project Stardust, under the control of Director Krennic. 
Vader's first move was to achieve revenge, though not revenge on the one who liberated him from his master. It was revenge on the individuals that caused him so much pain, the crime lords. Palpatine allowed the crime lords to flourish. If they got too big, then he sent a couple destroyers to quiet them down. Vader, on the other hand, was forged through the implementation of suffering in the Outer Rim, and he was not going to allow that to continue. Without someone to keep a leash around Vader, he was the ultimate power in the universe, though the one fear was whoever killed Palpatine could likely kill him. At the moment, that didn't matter. He would find that rival in the Force and kill them. Right now, he was taking an Imperial fleet to the Outer Rim, and he was going to dispatch all the Crime Lords. While his father was about to rip through the Outer Rim, Obi-Wan was talking to Luke Skywalker on the planet of Tatooine. Obi-Wan had a lot to reveal to the son of Anakin Skywalker. They had kind of covered the lineage, only on the count that Luke figured out that Obi-Wan was hiding information from him. Obi-Wan wouldn't have made it clear otherwise, if Luke wasn't so attuned to the Force as he was. Obi-Wan first started with showing Luke how to levitate objects. Yes, Luke figured out how to do that previously, but it wasn't a controlled means of lifting and moving objects. Obi-Wan wanted to show Luke how to control himself and his mind when he was levitating objects. It would first help him become a Jedi, and secondly, it would help him lift heavier objects with more control. Obi-Wan was helping Luke connect himself deeply to the Force. He was already intertwined with the Force, but now that he had the guidance of a Jedi Master like Obi-Wan Kenobi, it could be incredibly necessary for him. What Revan did for Luke was open him up to the possibilities of the Force and what it could do for him. For Obi-Wan, he would begin to study the holocron of Revan. He hadn't ever opened it before, and he believed that if he studied it, he'd be able to help Luke where he failed Anakin. Having taught Anakin, Obi-Wan was more than prepared for training Luke. But this holocron had information that he needed, information that not even the Jedi of the Galactic Republic utilized. Revan's era was one of chaos and of war. His information was vital to this time of chaos and war now. Obi-Wan having the mindset of, no matter how much he knew, he always had more to learn. But Obi-Wan wouldn't just study the holocron by himself, he would go through it, find the information he was searching for, and show Luke Skywalker said information. It was a combined effort from both legendary Jedi Masters from their respective eras. Luke, having already unlocked the Force within himself, had a very easy time learning alongside Obi-Wan. Revan spoke an older form of galactic common, and so for Luke, it was a bit hard to understand what he was saying. Obi-Wan was able to break it down in each lesson with each teaching for Luke. On the other side of the sands of Tatooine, Owen and Beru were losing their minds. They had been searching for Luke for days, and even worse than that, Obi-Wan was nowhere to be seen. Owen knew that Obi-Wan was leaving their area so that Luke could grow alone, so it could only mean one thing that Luke likely got abducted by the Tusken Raiders, just like Owen's stepmother had. Because Owen considered Luke to be his son, he and Beru left the homestead and made their way to find the Tusken Raiders that likely took their son away from them. In the Outer Rim, a fleet emerged from hyperspace. A number of Star Destroyers were present. Out from the Star Destroyers, Imperial dropships departed for the surface. Behind them was Lord Vader's personal shuttle. The Crimson Dawn had gathered up at the homeworld of the Pike Syndicate on their homeworld of Obadiah. It wasn't just the Pikes or Crimson Dawn. Their allies were all present, various representatives from other pirate gangs, the Huts, and the Black Sun. They were blindsided by the Imperial Assault. Vader's flagship ripped through the Crimson Dawn superyacht, and dropships avoided flak. When they landed, Imperial stormtroopers rushed from the dropships and got into combat with the pirates of Crimson Dawn. Maul knew that his operation had been discovered, but there was a rival here. It was Lord Vader. If Maul killed Vader, then he would be the one true Sith Lord. Of course, Maul being unaware that Darth Krayt was elsewhere in the Outer Rim. Maul, instead of falling back, tactically decided to hold the palace on Obadia, forcing the various members of the crime families to fight back. At the same time, an Imperial invasion fleet arrived over Ord Mantel, Nal Hutta, and Tatooine. Their main targets were the Black Sun and the Hutt crime family. Vader had all this ready to go, and once Palpatine was dead, he initiated it without a second thought. Crime lords were so blindsided that they weren't able to defend themselves. The few bounty hunters around were no match, and they either fled or were subsequently executed alongside their bosses. On Obadia, Vader's shuttle landed, and he walked through the rubble of his invasion. There were numerous dead stormtroopers around him as he walked through the rubble. Vader didn't budge as blaster fire flew past him. The stormtroopers on the front lines were trying to break through the palace defenses, and they couldn't. That would be no issue for Lord Vader. He raised his hand and the palace doors shattered open. 
Stormtroopers rose from their feet and ran forward. They knew better than to wait for Vader. The commander of the troopers ran up to Vader, telling him that they had a breach on the far side of the base, but they lost communication with the men and the team that breached. Vader swiftly told the commander to leave that to him. On the other side of the palace, stormtroopers barged through the back door, and they confronted Darth Maul. The aging Sith assassin cut down the stormtroopers as they piled in. Maul was learning to move Vader to his position because that's what he wanted. He wanted Vader to play his game, and that's what Vader was going to do. The Dark Lord came around the far side of the palace. He looked around silently as his breathing echoed down the hallway. The red face that he last saw so many years ago as a boy in that boo emerged. He wasn't wearing a hood, but he had aged. Vader stopped in his tracks, kicking a stormtrooper's arm out from under his heavy boots. Maul stepped forward. So good to see you. Lord Vader, isn't it? Have you finally killed my former master? After realizing how expendable you were, it did take you long enough. You're not much for conversation, Dark Lord. No final words to say. You are nothing. Vader ignited his lightsaber and dragged his blade through the air forward. Maul jumped backwards, igniting his own lightsaber and clashing with Vader. Maul knew he had a significant disadvantage here. At this point, he hadn't realized that Vader was Anakin, but he did know that Vader had the height advantage. For someone like Maul, he had to fight a consistent uphill battle against a man constructed of metal. However, this didn't mean that Maul was helpless. He, after all, was the one who trained the powerhouse duelist that was his brother Savage Reds. Maul was able to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with Sidious, and he had no issue believing that he could best the pawn of Sidious. Vader and Maul smacked their blades together, and Maul was thrown off balance. Each of Vader's strikes got heavier and heavier. Maul was thrown from his balance every time he parried a block to strike from Vader. The Dark Lord was hulking, and he had been craving a victory ever since Kenobi bested him a few short months beforehand. Out from the corner, Kiera leapt forward, using Dryden Voss's electric knives. Vader didn't even take his attention off of Maul, as he beat down on Maul, throwing Maul from his feet once more, and reaching out with the force, choking Kiera in midair. She dropped her weapons, and she stopped simultaneously in midair. Vader didn't give her a moment, snapping her neck and then standing over Maul. Did you really think you could defeat me? I know who you are. You are Kenobi's student. You are the Chosen One, the one who brought forth the downfall of the Jedi. Did your former master do that to you? Vader swung down, trying to slice through Maul, but missing. Maul got to his feet and jumped back, trying his best to avoid Vader's strikes. The wall was destroyed, open by Vader. He was beyond pissed. He was called out. There was no feasible way that any being could know who he was. Anakin Skywalker was dead, and so would Maul be. Maul cried out, trying to plead with Vader. I only wish to join you in accomplishing our similar goal, in defeating Kenobi. I don't need you. Vader raised his hand and Maul lifted from the ground and was dragged into his grip. Vader lowered his lightsaber and squeezed. Maul kicked his metal feet, but he couldn't go anywhere. He used a force to pull his weapon towards his hand. He grabbed it and ignited it, but before he could strike Vader with the weapon, Vader so elegantly twisted his hand and Maul's life ended. He dropped the body of Maul and walked forward, before seeing a lob of pirates running away from the stormtroopers. Vader inside of his mask smiled, igniting his lightsaber once more, stepping down the hallway, ripping apart the wall, throwing pieces of the wall at the pirates, before swiping down on them, cutting them apart and stabbing others. He blocked the few blaster shots that came his way, before making the rest of them suffer painful deaths. The few stormtroopers who came forward watched in awe, and then backed off, lining the edges of the hallway as Vader stormed forward, walking past the stormtroopers. There were echoes of blaster fire throughout the palace, but it was dying down. When Vader got back to his shuttle, the Imperial commander told him that the huts, the Black Sun, and the various others across the galaxy had been destroyed. The Empire was victorious. On Tatooine, Obi-Wan and Luke went on a journey throughout the desert. With the Empire appearing on Tatooine, Ben decided to voyage deep into the desert to avoid the possible attack of the Empire or the Inquisitorius. Not to think he couldn't defeat the Inquisitors or Vader again, he just didn't want to risk it with Luke in his hands. Though the Empire was simply there for a completely unrelated reason. As for Owen and Beru, they were slaughtered by the Tusken Raiders, who had nothing to do with Luke's disappearance. Their death happened while Luke and Ben were out on their miniature journey, and neither one of them felt it through the Force. Regardless, Luke's training was going really well. The Holocron of Revan was integral to his training process. Inside of the Holocron were holograms that show Luke what Revan was doing. The Holocron itself was very visual. However, 
While the two of them were out in the desert, Obi-Wan handed Luke his father's weapon. The lightsaber of Anakin Skywalker now belonged to him. Ben showed Luke how to wield the weapon, which essentially entailed allowing the energy of the lightsaber to bind with his own energy. It's something every Jedi and every lightsaber user knew. To wield a lightsaber took energetic knowledge and alignment. If one had neither of them, then they would struggle to wield such a weapon. A regular lightsaber, such as Anakin's lightsaber, wasn't nearly as heavy as a darksaber, for example. But they were all something that required energetic intelligence. Once Luke learned how to energetically tie himself to the weapon, Ben told him, Luke, I will be returning to the homestead. This is for your own growth. I know that the Tuscans frequent this area, and you will be scared. But with your training thus far and what I have shown you, I want you to trust in the Force. This holocron will guide you. When you are ready, you will be able to find me. May the Force be with you." Luke didn't at all know how to respond. He was being left in the desert alone, in a part of the desert where the Tusken Raiders came often. Though Luke didn't know the true power of the weapon he was holding. The lightsaber in his hands had been the one used to slaughter not just younglings, but the men, women, and children of the Tusken Raiders. It was done over someone who was closer to Luke than he'd ever know, considering Shmi was buried right outside of his bedroom his entire life. Luke would spend five days and five nights in the desert. Every waking moment he spent in the desert, he was not just afraid, but tested. If they were on Dagobah, this would have been similar to going down into the caves of Dagobah. But considering Tatooine wasn't exactly as force powerful as Dagobah, Obi-Wan had to do with what he could with what was available. During the five days, Luke had all the necessary surprise to make sure he didn't starve to death or dehydrate. Though something incredible happened. He spent all five days with the holocrons, learning how to use the lightsaber, and because Obi-Wan forced him to survive on his own, he became a beacon of the force. During the time that Luke was in the desert, Obi-Wan had been preparing a surprise for his young student for when he returned to the homestead. A little further away in the outer rim, a ship crashed onto the barren landscape of Mustafar. The Sith Lord Darth Krait escaped Coruscant and searched for a dark side nexus which led him to the planet Lord Vader called home. At this point, he hadn't realized that Vader called Mustafar home. Most of the planet had begun to heal, lava was lessening, and there were mostly just small streams of lava that crossed the great mountainous landscape of the planet. When Darth Krait landed, he was searching for guidance from the Force, from the dark side. The guidance he picked up on was the essence of Lord Momin, though it wasn't what he really thought it was. Krait limped across the sulfur landscape, crunching onto the terrain with each step he took trying to keep his balance. Admittedly, it was difficult though. Palpatine put him through the ringer, and he couldn't really stand all that well, let alone walk. The essence he was searching for sat beneath a large structure. Krait yet hadn't figured out that Vader's castle was newly constructed. Krait, having been from Tatooine, didn't know that Mustafar used to be filled with volcanoes and oceans of lava. Nowadays, it didn't have the same level of magma, so naturally he assumed that Vader's castle belonged to the essence of Lord Momin, and that Vader's castle was a really ancient relic of the Sith. The truth is that Momin had been defeated by Vader only years before. Krait didn't know what he was looking for. He made his way into the cave system below the castle and found a stone slab lined up against a wall. There were a small fire burning inside of the cave as well. He's very confused by what this could possibly be, and then he heard the breathing. Krait was very confused. All of a sudden, the essence of Momin vanished, and it was replaced by something much larger, much darker. Vader had set this trap for whoever killed his master. This wasn't revenge by any means, but Vader assumed that if someone could just kill Palpatine, then it could be a threat to him as well. But that was the opposite. Vader towered over a wounded Darth Krait. The Sith wasn't going to back down from Lord Vader. However, there wouldn't be time for something like that for Darth Krait. Vader stepped forward and without igniting a lightsaber or appearing as a threat, more so than his presence already was, he reached out his hand. He could feel that Krait was powerful, but not quite as powerful as the Emperor. How could that be? How could Krait have been able to kill Sidious? It must have been by happenstance, but even that seemed far-fetched. Vader lifted Krait off the ground with the Force, without choking him as he questioned the Sith. Who are you? Why are you here? I am Krait. I assume I killed your master. I've come for knowledge of the dark side. I am no teacher. Then I seek allegiance. There's a growing light in the galaxy. You've had to have felt it. There is no light. I've extinguished it, you fool. You can't rule the galaxy. Something is coming for you. Nothing can stop me, Krait. Not Palpatine, not Maul, not any Jedi, and most certainly not you. In an instant, Krait's life was snapped out of existence. Vader dropped the Sith Lord to the ground in shame, too. 
He actually would have liked to ally himself with the Sith, but he decided to challenge him. Vader knew that no light was coming for him. The only challenge to him was Obi-Wan Kenobi, but Obi-Wan had gone missing once again. Other than Obi-Wan, or even the unlikely prospect of running into Master Yoda, there was no reason for Vader to fear anything. The irony of the whole situation involving Darth Krayt is the fact that it told Vader that he could have killed Sidious this entire time, and yet he didn't. With all the extra time and power, Vader made an effort of focusing on the Force more, but it did get better than that. He made a specific concentrated effort on being the Emperor of the Galaxy. He of course wasn't involved in anything revolving around politics. If you thought Anakin hated politicians, imagine what Vader thought. Vader's regime was one with no brown nosing. The Imperial officers who appeared to be trying to gain favorability with the new Emperor were quickly killed off. Vader had those he respected, and those who were very close to being on his hit list. One of those individuals close to being on his hit list was Director Krennic, but his importance on Project Stardust was a bit more concerning to him than being on the hit list. Vader was very interested in what his master had been hiding from him, because there were certainly dozens of documents and information that Palpatine didn't want him to know or have. So what could it be? Vader searched far and wide for answers, and this would boil down to interrogating former Palpatine loyalists. For Vader, interrogation wasn't exactly too difficult to deal with. He was, well, after all, Darth Vader. The skull of a mask and heavy breathing and the little fact that he stood like a skyscraper was intimidating enough. Very soon, Vader learned of a location on the planet of Wayland, so he made a journey to the core world to find out what he could find at the facility named Mount Tantus. On the planet of Tatooine, Luke would make his way back to Obi-Wan, after being alone for five full days, and he would find his surprise. The five days that Luke was out there was entirely his choice. Ben wanted Luke to spend time out in the desert alone, and he was free to come back whenever he wanted, whether that be two hours after he left or two weeks. Regardless, when Luke returned, he saw a taller man that he didn't recognize, and next to him was a little girl. Bail Organa turned around, and the last time he saw Luke, the boy was actually just an infant. Obi-Wan spoke up, telling Luke, Luke, come over here. I want to introduce you to your twin sister. The young boy didn't know how to process it. When Leia turned around, it was as if in that very moment, everything besides what Ben had told her earlier on their little journey, she knew that Luke was her brother. Not to mention that Leia did have memories of her mother before she died, so seeing Luke was like seeing family, real family, not the dreary cousins that she had on Alderaan. Luke looked at Leia a little skittishly. He wasn't antisocial by any means, but he also didn't have a lot of friends or relationships that his father had. And in Mos Espa. Luke was solitary a lot of the time, or if he wasn't, he was with his aunt and uncle. Obi-Wan brought Luke over to his side and told Luke that Bale was kind enough to bring Leia here. I will be taking over your training for the time being. We will be going to Alderaan because of the Empire's recent invasion of Tatooine. But we have to be careful. It appears the Empire had gotten a little more open with making itself present in the Outer Rim. Luke, of course, had the choice to go. But how could he say no? Luke didn't hate sand like his father did, but he never really cared for Tatooine, and without knowing his aunt or uncle were dead, he didn't really care to see an issue with leaving Tatooine behind, so he agreed. On the trip from Tatooine to Alderaan, Leia and Luke would get to talking. When Bail and Leia showed up at Obi-Wan's homestead on the second day that Luke was in the desert, Obi-Wan told Leia everything that he had told Luke aloud by Bail. There was one issue for Obi-Wan, and it wasn't a glaring one as it was with Luke, but Bail Organa and Brea Organa were deeply attached to Leia. Sure, they wanted Leia to go out into the galaxy and grow up and become sophisticated. They were Alderanian, of course. But Leia was their daughter still. In their eyes, she was their legitimate daughter. And for Leia, she never really accepted Vader as a real father, because to her, her father couldn't be so vile. So the feeling was mutual between Leia, Brea, and Bail. Obi-Wan didn't want Bail or Brea to treat him in the same way that Owen and Beru did. The plus side is that Bail and Obi-Wan were already good friends, so the likelihood of that happening was actually very low. Most Espa, on the other hand, was erupting in the chaos. While the Sith and the Empire were drastically evil as a regime, the truth is the crime lords, especially Jabba the Hutt, had a very important role here on Tatooine, as a daimyo of Mos Espa. With Jabba removed, all the order and balance of the city would deteriorate. It would turn into a chaotic war zone, and there would be terror that the Empire didn't care enough to worry about, because no one did. And because Jabba was the target of the attack, Major Daimyo Viv Fortuna, Jabba's right-hand man, was also killed. So there wasn't a legitimate replacement for Mos Espa, and the people of the major Tatooine city would suffer because of it. On Alderaan, Luke and Leia would be taken into the forest by Ben. 
Bale and Brea got Luke and Ben situated. Of course, they had to be careful, so Ben was given a small estate outside of the main city, whereas Luke was able to take out residence inside of a room next to his sisters in the main palace. He was also outfitted with the royal attire. This was a decision made by Obi-Wan, Bale, and Brea before any of the moves were made from Tatooine to Alderaan, because they wanted Luke and Leia to get along without either of them feeling like they were being cheated or treated any differently than the other. The only issue was the lack of lightsaber for Leia, but Obi-Wan always came prepared. He gave Leia his own lightsaber. He knew she would use it in the future and that she was the future, just like her brother, and so she was to wield his lightsaber until she was ready to make her own. However, that would take time, just as it did for Luke. Leia had to learn about everything else regarding the Jedi and their teachings. The influence that Revan had on the Skywalker twins was indescribable. There were certain lessons they got from him that many of the Jedi from Obi-Wan's era hadn't had. The first lesson for the twins, one that only was utilized by one of them, was the ability of psychometry. It was something that Obi-Wan knew Quinlan Vos to use, but he didn't know where Quinlan was. Obi-Wan was one of the many Force users that couldn't use it. It's something Luke also couldn't use. It was a natural gift that Leia possessed. Vice versa, something Revan taught was Force Drain, which Luke was especially gifted with, though both Luke and Obi-Wan agreed that it wasn't in anyone's best interest to use such a power. The second lesson, the one that included both twins, was Force Bond. The ability was, again, a rare ability. Revan was just an individual who was insanely gifted, and his bond with Bastila was something that just didn't happen often. It was almost like a gift from the Force, if you will. Similarly, because Luke and Leia met at such a young age, they were instructed by two legendary Jedi Masters on how to truly and properly use the Force, and they had no issues with learning these incredible abilities. There was one issue, though. Because Obi Everyone was unaware of Leia's psychometric abilities. When she held his lightsaber, she saw so much, and she felt incredible pain, having to see her father on Mustafar, and then she saw her father do something that Obi-Wan distinctly left out. One night, Leia would leave the comfort of her palace room and run to Obi-Wan's home. He could feel the concern coming from her, and he woke from his sleep. Ben left his residence to find her in the forest, and when he did, she was in tears. Leia had a lot of emotional baggage to unpack with Obi-Wan. She saw everything, from the Clone Wars to the fight on Mustafar, and then, and then Leia couldn't even say it. And then the final confrontation not more than a year before. Leia never understood why Obi-Wan left the path during their escape from the Imperial Star Destroyer, but now it all made sense. She couldn't tell if she was angry or if she understood. Leia distributed several instances of knowing more than what others said. She even did this with Obi-Wan, and she could tell what he was feeling. She couldn't understand. Why would he let Vader live? What would possess Obi-Wan to let Anakin live twice? He was and is so evil, he caused so much pain and so much suffering. Why? Obi-Wan looked down at Leia and he apologized. I'm sorry, Leia. I never realized you could see the past through the lightsabers. They're so high in energy, I never knew you'd lock onto those memories. But the truth is, Leia, in both circumstances, I looked into the eyes of Vader, and all I saw was the little boy I raised. All I could see was the pupil I had for 13 years of my life. Anakin wasn't just a friend, he was my brother. Leia, I loved your father with all my heart, and I couldn't bring myself to do it. Vader or Anakin, when I see his face, all I see is the kid I met on Tatooine. Leia looked at Ben. There was a moment of silence between the two of them. Obi-Wan thought about Anakin's lightsaber. The one that Luke wielded. Obi-Wan couldn't let Leia touch that lightsaber. Leia looked down at the lightsaber that belonged to Obi-Wan. Both of the lightsabers were set on the table next to each other. The kids weren't allowed to have those weapons inside the palace. Leia looked back at Obi-Wan. It's like they could speak without saying a word. Leia knew she couldn't touch her father's lightsaber. She also didn't want to bring this up further. Obi-Wan spoke up though. Leia, you have a gift. A friend of mine, another Jedi, had the same gift you have. He once told me that as a child it was difficult for him to handle. I will do my best to help you through this. Just remember, Leia, I'm always going to be on your side." Leia smiled, and then she put her hands on Obi-Wan's. To Leia, as much as she loved her adopted parents, Ben was like a father to her in a way, almost more than Bale could ever be, because Obi-Wan was inextricably connected back to Anakin Skywalker, and it made their bond so very much more so like father and daughter. Ben and Luke had a very solid connection too, and it was tight, but just not as tight as Ben and Leia. Most of their connection was built through the traumatic event of nearly a year beforehand, so it made sense why they were so close. 
Across the stars, the empire would grow exponentially. With Vader at the helm, the Imperial Industrial Complex would explode. This again is because Vader didn't tolerate Imperial officers trying to gain favorability. If there was someone caught trying to suck up, then they'd be executed. No one would get higher by trying to sabotage their colleagues. Only the best would be the best. It's why Vader liked Thrawn. However, Thrawn did test him from time to time, and that's because Thrawn was fairly confident that Vader was Anakin Skywalker. He wasn't entirely sure, but it was a theory correct as it was. Vader, on the other hand, was following a breadcrumb trail across the galaxy. After arriving on Mount Tantus, he discovered a secret cloning facility, and then a sequence of words played out from his mind, and it was rather obvious. Maybe he was being ridiculous or paranoid, but to Vader, it seemed as if Palpatine was somehow trying to be alive. It was possible. But was it plausible? He saw his dead body. Maybe Palpatine's thread of loyalists went deeper, and so, he backed away from the Empire and traced it down. The next five years would be full of learning endeavors for the Skywalker twins. Leia and Luke at this point were both 16 and both incredible. Ben had a lot to learn about teaching, and having opened himself up to the teachings of Revan, was able to aid Luke and Leia in their growth as a Force user individually. The balance and harmony between the powerful light and powerful dark allowed Luke and Leia to come into their own as very incredible powerful force users. Their lightsaber training was off the charts. Inspired by Revan, both Luke and Leia were proficient in Form 4. However, because of her bond to Obi-Wan, Leia adopted more so around Form 3, which made her essentially a mini version of Ben, because Obi-Wan used Form 4 until he moved on into Form 3 after Qui-Gon's death. It was kind of ironic. The two of them also constructed new lightsabers, but this didn't stop a teenage Leia from discovering what her father did by using her psychometric abilities on his old lightsaber. The Skywalker twins, especially Luke, relished on Alderaan, but change was happening in the galaxy. First it was noticed on Aldani, and then on Ferrix. But the beginning of rebellion was so deep-rooted across the galaxy. It also formed on Lothal with a duo of two Jedi that were able to kill the Grand Inquisitor. Vader didn't really care. He deployed someone else to deal with it, and that someone else happened to be Grand Admiral Thrawn. Thrawn wasn't playing around, especially considering he was trying to begin the creation of the TIE Defender project, but Masa Meda wasn't allowing it, and Vader had just come back from Palpatine's Greatest Hits tour, seeing every cloning facility, every Sith planet, and finding absolutely nothing in the way of Palpatine being alive. Vader was just paranoid, having spent as much time as he did searching for Palpatine. Though the irony being that if Krayt attempted to kill Palpatine at least a decade later, Palpatine would have likely been able to survive. But it also was too early for his contingency plans to really go into effect, so they didn't. Vader having returned would set himself up inside the Jedi Temple and restructure it into his own version of the castle that Palpatine first had. Vader felt no sign of what Krayt had been talking about, but he was also disconnected from the galactic events that had been happening and the few rebellions that had been popping up, but it didn't really worry him. With Project Stardust nearing completion, it wouldn't really be that much of a worry. However, Vader, unlike Palpatine, liked the idea of Thrawn constructing the TIE Defender. It seemed a lot more feasible for the Imperial military, if at the very least, every fleet can have a squadron of these super TIE fighters. Especially based off of rebel attack patterns, it made perfect sense. Vader knew the rebels were guerrilla fighters. After all, one of them was taught how to be a guerrilla fighter by Anakin himself on Onderon. A super weapon like Stardust might be effective at coaxing a planet, but the galaxy wouldn't stand for an imperial regime that frequently detonated planets. On the other hand, the TIE Defender would likely be the perfect counterattack made by rebel fleets, which were typically hit and run battles, where the rebellion would jump in, do damage, and then immediately flee. Vader trusted Thrawn to take down the rebels, and so Project Stardust would be cut funding, temporarily, as to make room for the TIE Defender program that was being launched on the Thal in an effort to deal with the rebels. Bail Organa would eventually receive word that the rebels on Lothal were being threatened with a new weapon. Obi-Wan knew it was time, especially because he'd heard that there were reports of two Jedi already present out on Lothal. The Jedi needed to come together. Obi-Wan believed the Jedi could still be saved, and so he would go and reunite with the few survivors left in the galaxy. The three Jedi, thanks to Bail Organa, would unite with Kanan Jarrus and the rest of Ghost Squadron. The rebels of Ghost Squadron had already amassed a strong enough force to draw the attention of the Empire and enough attention to have Thrawn knocking on their doorstep. 
Ben was a little worried about his presence would do, because it would likely draw the attention of Vader. And this time, Vader had six years to think about everything that had happened since their last encounter, and he would likely have shimmered down a little bit, and become a little bit more patient by now. Vader may have made the mistake twice, but surely he wouldn't make it again. It's alright, this time, Obi-Wan had allies, but these allies had their backs up against the wall. It was at this moment Obi-Wan realized the real effect that he had. He was a renowned Jedi Master. It may have been 16 years since the Clone Wars, but he was one of the most known faces during the war, entire war effort actually. Everyone knew his name, just like they knew Anakin Skywalker and Ahsoka Tano. Their names were on billboards across the entire Republic, because they were the heroes of the Republic. For people serving the rebels who were too young during the war, they knew his face. For rebels who watched the Republic turn into the dictatorship, they also knew his face and his name. He had a transcendence appearance, but you would never know it because of how humble he was, though this attention was what got Vader's attention. Imperial spies found Kenobi and reported it to Imperial High Command. While Vader was beelining it to the Outer Rim from Coruscant, the rebels were planning on an operation. Considering both Luke and Leia were taught how to fly by none other than Obi-Wan, and their genes permitted them to both be excellent pilots, the rebels along with Kanan and Ezra had enough solid pilots to take every single Imperial TIE Defender inside of Lethal's testing base. But that wasn't enough. They were also capturing someone else, someone who was integral to everything in the Imperial Strategic High Command. The assault would be launched and it would catch Admiral Thrawn and Governor Price completely off guard, though it wasn't as sudden as a Saul Guerrera attack, which typically were more aligned with insurgency. This was an attack that aligned more with the hope and dream for change in the galaxy. The strike was quick. The Empire had its test runs at night, so to avoid possible rebel cells finding the TIE Defender location, and that didn't work too well because of Bail Organa. The four Jedi ran into the base, incapacitating every single guard. They each got into their respective starfighters, and then the few other rebels got into their own ships. The TIE Defender that was running its test was shot out of the sky as it crashed down onto the ground. The ghost ship barreled out of the sky. Governor Price and Admiral Thrawn called out the guard to fire on the ship, but the anti-aircraft was shut down, thanks to Chopper, and the guards were all taken out. The entire fleet of TIE Defenders rose from the surface and pulled away. Thrawn pulled out his pistol, and before he could fire a single shot, his blaster was pulled away from his hands with the force. He turned around, and Obi-Wan was standing at the edge of the ramp of the Ghost, where he used a force to pull both Governor Price and Admiral Thrawn towards the vessel. Hera over the comms yelled over, telling Obi-Wan to get into the ship. Obi-Wan looked up, and the sound of a TIE advanced fighter came bolting down to the surface of the planet, firing its blasters away. Both Thrawn and Price were killed by Vader's loose shots. Obi-Wan ignited his lightsaber and told Hera to go. Vader landed a solid number of shots on the ghost itself, throwing it into the command center while the bay doors were still open, which threw Obi-Wan from the ship. Hera pulled away as she tried to engage a dogfight with Vader, but he was already booking it around, trying to hunt the rebels and the TIE defenders. Both Luke and Leia knew it was Vader. Using their force bond, they communicated with each other. They then told the rest of the rebels to escape with the TIE defenders. They would deal with the TIE advanced. The twins ripped their ships back around in search for Vader. The ghost limped its way away from Vader as it got behind the rest of the TIE Defenders, trying to escape. Luke and Leia were both clipped by a flyby, and Vader rounded the ship around, seeing that Kenobi was on the landing strip. Luke and Leia also saw this. Kenobi wasn't much of a fighter anymore. He was nearing his 60s, and he wasn't exactly in the best shape for combat. No matter, the TIE Fighters zeroed in, and Kenobi ignited his weapon and launched it towards Vader's ship, whipping the lightsaber forward. He used a force to guide Blaster Bolt away from him as Vader's tie got closer and closer. The lightsaber landed in the cockpit, smashing through the control panel, then Luke clipped the side of Vader's ship with the TIE Defender weapon systems. Kenobi ducked, and the TIE Fighter slammed into the ground behind him. Obi-Wan looked back at the wreckage of flames. Obi-Wan was unarmed. He no longer had his lightsaber to fight Vader with, but the two TIE Defenders pulled around and landed. Obi-Wan tried to tell the Skywalker children to get back, but they wouldn't listen, just like Anakin wouldn't. Leia got in front of Ben, knighting her lightsaber as her brother followed suit. Obi-Wan watched as from the fires came a shadowy figure. Obi-Wan told the two of them that he was unarmed. They would have to use all their training against Vader to try and take him out without him. Leia looked back and smiled as she turned around. I see you were trying to restart the Jedi, Kenobi. Trust me, young ones, the dark side is a pathway to many more abilities than this feeble old Jedi can teach you. We are no ordinary Jedi, Anakin. Leia stepped forward. Vader was furious. He tried to sever any connection to Anakin Skywalker, and this youngling 
Then Vader realized something. Neither of these children were old enough to be alive during the Purge. There was no way, and there would be no feasible reason for Obi-Wan to tell them who he was unless... Before Vader could connect the dots, he ignited his lightsaber to defend himself from an aggressive strike made by Leia. Luke moved in right behind his sister, as a usually offensive Vader was placed into defense. He was completely unprepared for the aggressiveness. Most Jedi were not aggressive towards him, and even if they were, they didn't get into this kind of jump. Though, Vader wasn't going to just take this. He batted away from the two young adults, parrying each of their strikes. Obi-Wan stood on edge, trying to see if he could pull his lightsaber from the wreckage, but he couldn't find it. Vader's heavy strikes threw the young duelist off a bit, but between Luke's aggression and Leia simmering down into Form 3, they were almost a perfect duo for beating their father. He was a powerhouse Sith Lord, and one thing he had on both of them was experience. Obi-Wan looked for a gap here, where could he find it to assist the twins, and then he saw one. Vader blocked a high strike made by Luke, and then shot a huge wave of force through the ground as it threw Vader from his feet. Kenobi knew how to beat Vader in the suit. This was how he did it before. It was up to Luke and Leia to see if they remembered what he did when he beat the Sith Lord originally. The two Jedi moved about as Vader tried to get to his feet, but his mask was slashed open by Luke, and his head recoiled to the ground, slamming against it. Vader used the force to push Luke away into his sister. The Dark Lord got to his feet as he looked at Obi-Wan, and then he turned to his children. They were his children, and he figured it out. As the deep brooding voice of the Dark Lord vanished, and the sound of Anakin's voice appeared. I am your father. Don't do this. I have a father, and he didn't kill my mother. Leia ignited her lightsaber. Vader tried to defend himself as he ignited his own weapon. Leia slashed it to the side, throwing the blade from her father's hand before spinning around and slashing her blade through Vader's chest. Both Obi-Wan and Luke were taken aback. Vader looked at his daughter and then his son before he was taken away into the dark abyss of the death only given by the dark side. Leia looked down at her father as she stepped away, dropping her lightsaber and falling to her knees. Luke came to his sister's side to see if she was okay, and as did Obi-Wan. Tears fell from her eyes, and once Ben got there, she wrapped her arms around him, telling him, I'm so sorry, Ben. I'm so sorry. The darkness is so cold. It's so cold. But I had to do it. I couldn't let him cause any more pain. I'm so sorry. Obi-Wan knew how she felt. He rubbed her back and told her that it was natural. They all had assumed that with the guidance of Revan's training, that they had surpassed the ability of faltering into the dark side, but the dark side was persuasive. It lashed onto Leia and it took control of her. Obi-Wan told her that it would be okay, telling her a story of when he was a young man, and he resulted to the dark side to get revenge. Leia was so ashamed of herself. Moments later, the ghost would land, and Harrow would run out to make sure that everyone was alright. Obi-Wan turned around and nodded his head. He helped Leia up and made sure she and Luke got on board, before he retrieved his lightsaber. The rebels would return to their secret base with the new Imperial technology that they had at their disposal. The strike of losing Darth Vader and Thrawn in the same night would leave shockwaves throughout the Empire. Masameda would take full control, fully of the reins, and because he'd essentially been in control since the Empire was formed, he didn't struggle with it. However, Masameda was no military strategist, and when word got clear that Vader was gone, Imperial officers became pushy, each of them vying for more power and more advantages in the Empire, which in turn for the Empire meant a lot of self-sabotage. The Ghost Squadron would be linked up with several operatives over the coming years, one of them being Cassian Andor, who, with his help, would lead the Rebels to a victory over the Empire. Because the Death Star was sidelined for an extended period of time without funding, the Rebellion would be able to find and crippled the super weapon before any of its external weapon systems were online. Of course, a strike like this was used with TIE Defenders and various other fighters, because the support fleet around the Death Star was far too large for an upfront invasion. Before Obi-Wan's natural death, he would see the beginning of a new Jedi Order, the happiness of the Skywalker twins, the resurgence of the Republic, the fall of an empire, and dictatorship for that matter. His death would come peacefully surrounded by a newfound family, a family of Jedi with the teachings of Revan, Skywalker, and Kenobi in a brand new temple, in a galaxy with a chance for rebirth. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is our story. Again, special thanks to Benjamin Wells, Tiger Board, Darth Revan, Pim Daddy Bane, Darth Cheesy, Apollo, Mad Many Stews, Anakin 003, Lemon Knight, Flynn, Ben Cease, and Lord Deadwing for supporting the channel. Hit the links on this video. I don't know what's coming next, but it is the next part of the miniseries. The finale is coming out this Saturday. There's going to be a full movie for it that I will be releasing afterwards. So for those of you that don't like to watch part ones or part twos or part threes or part fours, you got a full movie coming out at some point. Anyways, let's talk about the story. Um, there's room for a part three here. I would prefer not to do a part three. Um, 
because I'm personally content with the story, but I could I could see where a part three would be you know, kind of fun here. However, I, I just um, I don't really think a part three is necessary for this. So let's talk about the the story itself. Uh, so with a story like this, it's like with a Revan thing. I've done different iterations of Revan, and considering based off how I built the first story with like Revan being a part of the dreams, I felt like that part of the journey was kind of covered, and so I wanted this step of the journey, this particular arc of the story, to be more focused on on like the holocrons, the holocrons himself, because like the original story focused on the dream element, what that did for Luke. And again, obviously the story is titled about Luke, but in a part two like this, I feel like it was necessary to include Leia. And so uh, using her 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 power in psych- psychometry, psych- I can't pronounce that sometimes, psychometry, um, that's something that's um, legends, legends based. And it's also something that's kind of been seen in canon with the, the Kenobi show and her being young and still like remember, like her remembering Padme, for example, that's psychometric essentially in some way, shape or form. And so taking that and using Revan's distinct ability to use that at certain periods is something I want to take advantage of. The psychometry, force bond. So I wanted to, to play to the more unique attributes of Revan while also using Leia in this. And I think force bond worked really well. Of course, like I could have put like Mara Jade in here or something like that, but uh, I feel like we use Mara Jade a lot lately. So I decided against that. And yeah, so I, I felt like the, the ending of the last video was kind of made it set up. So you guys thought that Tarkin was gonna be the main bad guy. And I didn't have any plan on that being the case. Uh, if anything, he was going to be like the face of the Empire, but I, I, Tarkin just wouldn't be content with being the face of the Empire. He wants to be the head honcho, I think, in a situation where Palpatine isn't around. And I don't think Vader's going to tolerate that. On the side note of Darth Krayt, he was a C-plot. He was. He was always set up to be a C-plot. And I didn't really see anywhere for him to go. You know, he bested Palpatine, and that's kind of what I wanted him to do. I talk about this often enough, but... Palpatine is often like he's he's the main villain of all nine all, all nine canon films, Disney canon films, right? And so, regardless of what era I work with, uh, he's going to be the main villain, and it gets tiresome using the same villain. And so, Darth Krayt's entire purpose in the story. I saw a comment in the other video um, about like this isn't anything to do with what Darth Krayt's original story is. I know that I wasn't trying to do the original Darth Krayt story. If I did, then I would have stuck to it. But I wasn't trying to do that. Uh, the whole title with what if. That's kind of what I'm doing here. And so what if Darth Krayt being in the story, you know, he's not meant to follow the original journey he follows in, in Legends. And that's not what I'm going for. I'm just creating another villain for the plot to kind of get rid of Palpatine and put someone new as the main threat. And I think Vader's a good main threat. And I think if he discovered, because like, if you get rid of Palpatine, you have to talk about Tantus and, and, and the whole contingency plans. And so I had to make that kind of reasonable for Vader to be like kind of paranoid about that. And the main thing that Vader's thinking about is like the ability to survive death. And once he realizes that Palpatine has these cloning facilities, he's going to be like, um, this dude's probably still alive and that's an issue. And I think Vader would take that very seriously as a threat because, you know, that's what Palpatine promised. And he knows that Palpatine lies to him a lot. You know, he knows that Palpatine lies to him. That's shown, I think, in one of the comics. And so I wanted to convey Vader kind of coming to terms with the fact that he knows that Palpatine's lying to him, but also being like, I, you know, I should probably make sure that he hasn't cloned himself or something. So, yeah. And then the final finale of this video, uh, the finale of this video, I, I'm not going to lie. I, I, I think that's really cool. I think it's kind of badass, honestly. Like having Leia said like, uh, like that line by Leia, I'm not going to lie. I think that's really cool. I think it's cool. It's a little bit like Marvel-esque. It's kind of like, it's like, I am Iron Man, you know, that kind of whole thing. But it's, it's, I think it's a cool line. I don't know. Let me know. Let me know if you guys like that line. I thought it was a cool line, you know, like, <laughs> I thought it was cool. I, I, I don't know. That's just me. I thought that was cool. So I hope you all enjoyed this video. Uh, if you did, smash that like button. You know, uh, miniseries comes to an end this weekend and the next miniseries is going to come out straight afterwards. Not straight afterwards, but maybe like a couple weeks afterwards. I'm still writing it out. Uh, I got the whole plot out for the next season of the Earth series, and it's about nine episodes, so I'm excited for you guys to see it. Uh, otherwise, I love you all. Spread the love, and always remember, my friends, may the Force be with you.